Do you know what time it is? It's supernatural story time. And if you're easily scared, and even if you're not, there's only one thing left to do. Just turn off the lights, because these are stories that you listen to only in the dark. Something You Fear, Volume 2, Story 1. I've had a lot of experiences with ghosts and odd things, but there was one incident in my early youth that still scares the crap out of me. I have to give a little backstory here, as there's some twists and turns. I grew up on a 50-acre fruit farm, rolling hills going down to stands of fir trees, then a drop off to a wild river. Closest neighbor you couldn't see or hear, very isolated, and looking across the slope canyon across the river were only orchards on the other side with one lone house set far back, and this was easy miles as the crow flies. I used to explore all along the river up and down. There was an island in the middle of the river, and when it was low I'd jump rocks to get out there. My mom would have killed me if she'd known, as there were people drowned every year in that river. I'd dig for bottles at old abandoned house sites, stuck back in the trees with rusted Model Ts, covered by blackberry bushes, and slide down mudslide areas where the old garbage dumps, and dig for bottles all day. I was used to the area, knew what wildlife were around. There were pheasants, skunks, raccoons, and down by the river there was a beaver pond, but no deer or larger game. The edge of the orchard dropped off sharply towards the river. Lots of water draining there, and Dad cut a road down to the river. We could take the tractor and gun it through the mud wallows, coming back after a day of swimming and sunning on the rocks. There was a lot of thick brush, blackberries, and a lot of skunk cabbage in the swamp beer areas. Now, I'd explored almost every inch of those woods, including the neighbors, but there was one spot I could not find a way to get to. It was at halfway up the almost cliff-like ledge behind the beaver pond, and appeared to have a little clearing there of some sorts, and as if it was somewhat level. I thought that intriguing seeing as it was near vertical wall, and had often set out from below to try to find a way towards it, but always had to turn back. Up above that area, on the flat orchard ground, it was the furthest reach of our property. You couldn't see the house or barn from there, and was a good hike away from the house. Bordering that area was a strip of land I was oddly drawn to, and it was right above the intriguing area, though that seemingly clear patch was quite far below. You couldn't see down to it from up top, so I used to go sit at the very edge of the property right where it fell off down the cliffside, right at the entrance of what looked like a small path a skunk or raccoon would use. I'd sit there and think about plowing that strip of land to plant weeds, oats. Hell, I just wanted to plant something there. My dad was too busy to listen to my yammering and not about to plow that land up. We were always working on the orchard, but the year I was 12, I went and sat at that same spot many times in the afternoon towards sun going down. Now, we fast forward about 20 odd years, and I was with a group of friends thousands of miles away vacationing, and we came upon a healing festival with all kinds of free sessions and doodads. We'd been drinking a bit, and I decided I'd try out a free Reiki session. It's supposed to release and heal memories or energy. Not sure, but okay. I thought, why not? It was very interesting, relaxing. They don't touch your body, but hold their hands over you, and the woman said some things and then told me, something happened to you when you were 12. You thought you were going to die. I said, I couldn't remember anything like that at all, and kind of laughed. She said, you were so frightened. This is when you understood there is evil in the world. Okay. Still not ringing any bells. She asked me to keep thinking about that to try and remember. Well, about two weeks later, it hit me. I knew exactly what she had talked of, and I just got chills all over my body just thinking about it. I called my oldest sister thousands of miles away and started to tell her the story of the Reiki session and how I just remembered what scared me so bad. And I said, do you remember that area up above the beaver pond? That furthest back section of orchard with that clear strip of land? My sister replied, yeah. You wanted to plant wheat there or something. And I said, okay, well, I have something really weird to tell you. Remember there was that small animal trail there? She said, yeah. And then I said, and how it dropped off really sharply? Then there was this odd pause. My sister said, I know exactly where that was. And I said, well, 
I used to sit there a lot, like I was drawn to that spot. I just sit there right at the mouth of that little trail and imagine what I could do with that land. I remember how I always wanted to get to that one odd spot down the cliff, like it had a clearing there, but I could never get to it. Yes, my sister replied. She was being awfully quiet now. Then I said, I know this is going to sound insane. The last time I went there, I thought about trying to go down that little trail to get to that area. There were so many large branches and brush in the way, but I started it down about three feet or so, and this overwhelming feeling of fear and panic hit me. She said, oh my God. And I said, and at the same time, there was this huge sound of something crashing through the brush, snapping tree limbs and rumbling like a freight train. And we both said at the same time, but it was coming up the path, not running away. We were in complete shock that we each had the same incredible fear and panic. Heard and felt this incredible rumbling of footfalls and large tree limbs cracking like a freight train was barreling up from somewhere down below that very tiny 12-inch wide path towards us, knowing full well we were in grave danger. This was no deer, no animal. This was something evil and big. I had run like the hounds of hell were chasing me uphill across acres of orchards to get to the house, and little did we know back then that she had also been drawn to sit at that exact same little spot. No view to speak of, couldn't see the river, just an isolated little spot. Been drawn to start down that tiny path of the same experience, leaving her running for her life back home too. I pushed it out of my memory. Never talked about it, just as she had never talked either. I believe it was a Sasquatch. And for all you who don't live in the Pacific Northwest, that's fine to scoff. But there is nothing on that property that could have made that heavy pounding earth sound and cracking of tree limbs. Plus, we're talking a very steep and slippery hillside, more of a cliff. And there were no deer in that area. And I wasn't scared of anything at that age. There was ample water, skunk cabbage is supposedly a plant they favor. There were salmon and trout in the river, tons of apples, pears, peaches, cherries, berries to eat. You might not believe in Sasquatch, but there is no way I will walk alone or even in a pair in the northwestern wilderness. And definitely not without a firearm, nor will I camp out overnight. Another interesting incident I thought of later in the context of about one or two years before that time, my dad and I used to go down to an old dump on the property, very close to that incident, and he'd throw up an old paint cans in the air for me to shoot at with his thirty-eight. It was about dusk, time to go home, and when I stopped firing, there was the oddest, loudest shriek rose up somewhere over that ledge down by the river. My dad froze, cocked his head, and looked at me with what I now know is fear. Of course, he just said, what the hell was that? And he hustled me out of there my dad was no pushover and I know what mountain lions sound like which by the way there were zero of where we lived and this was no human made noise okay you say that's no proof either sure but listen to this I used to have a huge bat shaped kite like a wingspan of about four to five feet I put on a fishing pole reel and would let that thing fly up till it was a speck in the sky my dad loved flying that kite too and one day it got going so high and so far that the line snapped. I saw more or less where it went down and headed off. Mind you, we're talking a major hike off through the acreage. So I get down to the back of our property where it goes into an old field with abandoned old horse-drawn farm equipment, some old houses I'd go digging around in the fringe of trees before the cliff edge down to the river. I knew the kite had gone down just up a bit from that point and set off the left side of the field. And we're talking no homes, nothing but the back end of the orchards and old abandoned fields, and I'd never explored this far up before. So I'm going through waist-high grass looking for my kite, and I stop short, frozen, not believing what I'm seeing on this little hillside I'm climbing up. The first thing I see is a wire fence. We're not talking a couple of strands of barbed wire. This is a major chain-link fence with an iron reinforcement rods pounded in every five feet or so. It's about 12 feet high and topped off with a classic angled prison yard style three to four feet of razor wire and completely encircles a small house, a freaking fortress. I immediately drop to the ground and start shimming through the grass to get a better look. 
The next thing I see is an old fighter plane on a concrete pad in a small yard. Looks like some old World War I Red Baron with an old telephone book dangling from wire hung on the wings. The next thing I see, which almost makes me poop in my pants, leaned up against a crow's nest cupola. On the roof is a life-size dummy dressed in shirt and trousers, holding a shotgun. I kid you not. I backed out of there and forgot all about my kite. So what does that have to do with my story? The old man's house, later found out that he was crazy, was in direct line of sight with the exact area of my nightmare incident where that took place, and the dummy on the roof with a shotgun line of sight was aimed exactly at that area. Now you can draw your own conclusions. Story number two. I was 24, 25, and had stopped by my parents' house after getting off graveyard shift. We spoke longer than expected, and I became extremely tired to the point I didn't think it was safe to make the 20-mile ride home. In my mom's prompting, I went and laid down in my old bedroom. Immediately upon laying down, I noticed a neon green light through the holes in the pleated shades covering the window. I remembered thinking it was strange and decided to turn over so it wouldn't disturb my nap. No sooner had I turned over than I saw the closet door slowly opening. I grew up there. This door never opened due to any doors opening, AC, nor environmental factors. Then I heard the clickety-clack of quadruple claws, like a dog's on the terrazzo. It was coming toward me. I didn't see anything and didn't want to. I turned again, now my back, and away from the edge of the bed, getting ready to hide under the covers. That's when I felt the hot breath panting on my neck. I was paralyzed. It grew worse as I felt one, then two points of pressure on the bed. I could feel the mattress being weighed down, away from my arm, in two distinct depressions. I started to try to yell for my mom, but my voice was a tiny cry and immediately cut off from me. I felt the evil, and I mean real evil, coming off this thing. It was climbing up further, now with one paw on my chest and trying to force its way into my mind. I was yelling for my mom to no avail and trying to fight it off when I remembered to pray. It was making me forget the words which I've said thousands of times before and no sound was coming out of me. My body was paralyzed as I first tried to pull the covers over my head and then to thrash around, hoping to alert my parents. It was Jesus' name that finally broke the spell of this thing when I remembered I could pray in my head and be heard. I felt the weight lift as it jumped to the foot of the bed with a pissed off snort and the jingle of a pet collar. My parents had no pets, but it felt easily larger than my 140 pound press of canario as this thing fled from words given by God. My voice was instantly restored along with tears of relief and gratefulness. It felt as if it were going to either devour or possess me. Not sure what was up with that green light either. Never saw prior nor since that day, and I never want to again. Next story. We lived in a haunted house when I was a kid. My parents bought the house and little farm when they married. The house was built in 1898. Apparently things got interesting right away for them. It was a two-story house with a rough basement. The foundation was actually made of huge stones. Well, my mother decided that she would like to have her sewing machine in one of the unused rooms upstairs and asked my father to lug it up there for her. It was bolted to a fold-out table with drawers and was heavy and awkward. It didn't last long upstairs. She said that the door to the room would open by itself and that she had the most uncanny feeling of someone standing there watching her, or worse yet, that someone had come into the room with her. Sometimes she felt she could hear soft footsteps approaching down the hall outside. Finally, she asked my father to lug the sewing machine slash table back downstairs, which did not make him overly pleased. My father was a big, strong man, but the stairs were steep and narrow. Worse yet was the stuff that would happen at night. As I tried to sleep, my parents would hear footsteps upstairs, and then the doors opening and shutting by themselves. Then things would really break loose. On the narrow staircase would happen what my mother described as a knock-down, drag-out, vicious fight among several men. She said you could hear fists striking flesh, bodies being slammed against the walls of the staircase, 
and feet stomping and straining on the steps. As I said, my father was a big man and got his revolver a couple of times and threw the door at the bottom of the stairs open, but there was never anything there until it would start again. My mother was deeply distressed by this, and so was my father at first, but after a while he denied that he heard anything and told my mother it was her imagination. Well, my mother went to visit her mother for a week or ten days out of state. When she came home, my father had already left for work. My mother began to do the housework, including making the unmade bed. She discovered my father's revolver under his pillow. When he came home, she asked him why he was sleeping with a gun under the pillow. At first, he refused to answer, but finally admitted to her that the fight on the stairs had been happening every single night she was gone, and that, yes, he heard it, and it was not her imagination. Now, my two grandmothers were very different women. My mother's mother might be called Grandma Woo Woo. She had been struck by lightning as a young woman, and apparently as a result of that, began to have psychic visions. She was not happy about being psychic. As she explained it to me when I was a teen, most of what she saw when a vision would overtake her involve someone dying. She said she didn't care to know those things in advance and had reached a point that she would fight against having the visions. This grandma was convinced that the house was haunted. There was one room upstairs that she would not enter because she said someone had died there. She would not go upstairs at all unless someone went with her. My dad's mother was a very no-nonsense little farm wife who had helped to support the family during the Depression by raising hundreds or probably thousands of chickens and selling eggs. I would have been surprised to hear that she even believed in ghosts. Now this grandma was tending me and my toddler sister once my parents went out of town for the day. When they returned she took my mother aside and told her that she was always glad to tend us but from now on it would be at her house only. My mother asked her why, and she was evasive. My mother became concerned that we kids had misbehaved in some way and insisted that she answer. Finally, my grandmother told her, because there are people in this house. My mother thought she meant actual people, as in some kind of home invasion. My grandmother told her no, there was no one there, but that she heard people walking around upstairs, and doors opening and shutting, and people fighting on the stairs. Keep in mind that my parents had never told her of the problems they were having. Many years later, this house stood empty. My grandmother had remarried, moved away, and we were living in her previous home a few miles away. My sister was in junior high school, and one day a classmate got telling her about a frightening haunted house he and his buddies had been in. She realized at some point that he was talking about our house, which my parents still owned. The empty house had become a popular drinking hideout for teens. This classmate and two of his buddies had been there one night, and lo and behold, there were footsteps upstairs, and doors opening and shutting, and a fight on the stairs. They creaked the door open. No one was there. He said they nearly trampled one another getting out of there, and said he'd never go into it again for love nor money. Now, I myself never had any spooky experiences in the house. The only thing I remember is that I didn't like to play on the north side of the house because I felt very strongly that someone was watching me from one of the windows. Next story. When I was a younger man, I worked as a contract engineer. To get to sites within a 10 say region, I had purchased a plane, a Cessna 172. I would fly into the closest town, have a rental car at the airport, do my work for the week, drop off the car at the airport, and fly home. It was in the late 70s that we had left Flint, Michigan, Bishop Airport, and were going to fly to Toledo, Ohio, Toledo Express, using M23 as our visual guide. I was accompanied by another fellow, also a pilot and engineer. It was a beautiful August evening when we left Flint around 17.15 Eastern Time, and we had several hours of daylight under clear skies. I chose to let the other fellow fly the plane left seat as I was going to drive us once we got to Toledo and tie the plane down. We are about half a mile west of M23 Monroe County, Michigan, just north of Dundee, Michigan, when while I'm talking to my partner, I saw something twinkling out of his window to the east in the far distance. Thinking that this was another plane coming westbound, I called Toledo Express and asked if there was traffic in the region. 
This was before we had equipment in the plane which reported transponder date and position. They reported nothing, but a beach bonanza was coming out of Toledo Metcalf, which is southeast of Toledo, heading in our direction to Jackson, Michigan, in a few minutes, but we would be out of his airspace by the time he got to our location. As we continued along, I kept my eye on the craft, which was now obviously at our altitude, which was 5,500 feet. It was also obvious that they were going alongside at a good clip. I radioed Toledo Express and voiced my concern and was told, we have nothing on radar. For a few seconds, we thought about our situation, and then I also realized that what I thought was a twinkle was sunlight bouncing off five objects at our altitude and now had slowed so we were on an intersection at around Ottawa Lake, Michigan, two and a half miles north of the Ohio State Line. I made another call to Toledo Express and they denied any traffic, but then the plane, which had taken off from Metcalf, broke and saying, What the hell are those? I see them too. Then another pilot, who was coming west over Lake Erie Isle, St. George, at 7,000 feet, popped in and said, What are those? They look like the bubble on a Huey helicopter, but they're no props. They flew under me. At this point, we were closing in on them. Each was changing elevation slightly but on a straight west course, and they appeared to be about the size of a green pea at arm's length. So I took the stick, banked to the left, heading east at a 45-degree angle, leveled and seeing them now at my front window to the right, leveled and then banked again to the right west, going around the back of them. They appeared to be about 15 feet in diameter, and the texture sort of looked like the glass on a helo, but it was longer and wider than it was from top to bottom, reflective and smooth. After I got back over M23 continuing south, I called Toledo Express again, saying that they look out the north side of the tower, that they may see them to the north. The beach bonanza then piped up with, we got a visual on them, and they did not have prop or show contrail. Toledo Express then came on and said, gentlemen, we have nothing on radar, emphasizing nothing louder. As we crossed into Ohio, I could still see them in the west, probably south of Adria, Michigan, but then lost sight of them when we made our approach and dropped altitude to the southwest to come in on runway 25. After we got the plane parked and unloaded, I went up to the tower to get answers. There were two guys on duty, and when I started asking questions, the one guy walked away. The other guy talked, but as he answered questions about not seeing anything, he was as nervous as a lady of the night in church glancing around, not making eye contact. From the tower, they were about five miles south of the state line with clear visibility. So, if they did look, and considering the reflection of the setting sun in the west off the objects, they would have seen them. Both denied anything on radar, but their radar at the time was good enough. It could spot a return of that size from five to ten miles out. To this day, I don't know what the hell they were, but three other pilots saw them. They were what you would call UFOs since there was no identification made. Could they have been extraterrestrial? Maybe. Could they have been military? Maybe. What else could they be? Who knows? And maybe the tower saw it, but was instructed not to say anything. There are no big military bases around. The closest base would be Wright Pat, which is 122 miles south. To put a wrap on the story, another pilot, who was by South Bend, Indiana, heard the commotion, and he changed his flight path and started coming east, but never saw them. Looking through MUFON's records, there was a lot of activity in Leniway and Hillsdale County at that time, but no records. That was the first of two sightings, the second later in the 80s. Those who see things like this are often ridiculed, which is why no commercial pilot ever says anything, although many do see things. And I will say that having seen this changes your outlook. Some like me accept it, with question, others bury the memory as inconvenient and embarrassing. But I can tell you what I saw was real. Other people saw the same thing, and I have no damn explanation for what it was, who was piloting it, or where it came from. Next story. Pilots do indeed see things. I was flying a PA-28 from Billings, Montana to Big Timber, Montana. Around 6 a.m. It was July trip out and back was uneventful, did a couple touch and goes, a full stop, grabbed some gas, and headed back. I was flying left seat, 
a CFI in the right, and we were in contact with Tower getting vectored around to make room for a couple 767s coming in. As we're doing a couple more circles, we tuned over to get updated weather since we were almost 15 miles out. Everything was fine, with a notice for some RC planes flying around 400 feet up and 10 miles on the other side of the airport. There was a notice that a weather balloon may be coming down in the area, but the way the winds were blowing it seemed unlikely. A minute later, Tower sent us north to a practice area to get out of the way of a departing mail carrier. So we cruised down out there and were doing just some basic maneuvers to pass the time. At one point, the CFI turned around to grab a snack from the back seat, and while he's back there, I see a reflection up ahead like another plane would make. I checked my in-plane radar and I saw nothing. I asked the CFI, and he says that it looks like a plane to him, too. We called the tower and they said there's nothing on radar and that there shouldn't be anyone else there. So we started getting closer hoping it's the weather balloon and as we get closer it's pretty obviously not a balloon. And about a mile out we can make out something oblong shape very shiny and about 20 feet across. We can see its shadow on the ground. We call it into the tower and they again said there was nothing on radar. I keyed up the microphone to ask him if the weather balloon was possibly in the area from a wind shift when the radar and the plane suddenly gave us a collision warning. Thinking we might have stumbled across another plane by accident while looking at the weird orb thing, I banked hard to the right and added full power to climb away. Collision warning goes quiet and there is no other plane around. I banked around back towards the weird object and saw it ascending at about a thousand feet per minute. We reported the incident to the tower who heard it happen on the microphone since I had forgotten to let it go and asked us to call them on the phone when we landed. They also gave us a direct and clearance, putting us ahead of all other traffic. On the phone they said they had seen a blip on the radar for half a second when we had gotten the collision warning, and that another controller who had been looking in that direction by chance had seen something climbing very quickly that was only a sunlight reflection and far away. We filled out reports for the FAA and never heard anything about it ever again next story. This event was witnessed by two other pilots and a boat captain. The two other guys were an ER doctor and his dad, who was a doc at one time and was a vet. The boat captain worked on a lake freighter and had taken the year off due to knee surgery. We were going into the Grand Marais for a fishing expedition, just to the northeast of the airport, if you want to call it that, out in Lake Superior. There's a fantastic spot for big fish. We were flying one of our friends Cessna's turbo stationaire from Findlay, Ohio to Grand Marais, Michigan. We're supposed to leave at 1430, but one of the guys who works for the hospital in Findlay had to work over. We figured no foul and agreed to leave as soon as he got off, which turned out to be 2216 before we departed. The trip was uneventful and we followed I-75 up to M23 Toledo, then to where it joins I-75 again in Flint. And then, when we saw the Mackinac Bridge, we made a 45-degree turn left and completed the last 50 miles to Grand Marais, which again was uneventful. All the way it was clear. No turbulence until we got about to Newberry. We started to pick up some rather strong gusts, which was expected off of Lake Superior. But we landed in fine shape, taxied over to where the rental car was left, and tied down the plane. We were unloading the plane into the suburban when the doc said, Well, I'll be a son of a bitch. We all turned towards him thinking something got messed up, broken, spilled, but he was looking up. We all looked up, and there was your typical triangle silently moving above us at a four-degree northeast path. No noise, no flashing lights. The only lights we saw were not defined. It would be like looking at a light through a sheet of cloth where you can see the translucence, but no definition. There was a steady red-orange glow at each tip and a dark blue haze in the center. There appeared to be texture to it, but nothing we could make out. It had to be about 200 or 300 feet above us, and each side would have been 500 to 600 feet in length. As it moved away, you could see that the bottom was flat, and the sides rolled around up the top. The top could not be seen. It finally was out far enough that the trees obscured it, and we're sure it never went up otherwise. The red orange would have been seen ascending. Needless to say, we stayed up until dawn discussing this, and it was interesting that the boat captain saw things like this a lot in his career over Lake Superior and Huron. 
and the other fellow who flew transport said they saw things from time to time, but never admitted them as they were a career killer. It's interesting to note that some other guys mentioned that they had gone fishing and had been tent camping. This was two years later on the edge of the lake and witnessed the same kind of craft go from 170 south to 350 north then turn right over the lake and was seen again by tourists at Pancake Provincial Park 90 minutes later heading east-northeast. Next story. A friend and a former ATC guy had some impressive stories. One of them took place while he was working in the tower in Anchorage, Alaska in the early 80s, right around the time Reagan took office and started escalating with the USSR. This particular story started out just past dark when a satellite malfunction sent some fighters from Ellsworth Air Force Base scrambling in response to a possible strike force of Soviet aircraft coming in. Airspace around the base is closed, but obviously nothing came of it. This happened two more times, each time becoming progressively more frustrating. Finally, around 2 a.m., this friend of mine was getting on duty, being briefed by the previous shift supervisor on the events of the day and the suspected number of incoming flights. The shift changes, the last international flight until dawn arrives, and the airspace is quiet. The controllers were amusing themselves with a game of toss the popcorn kernels at each other with rubber bands when the long range approach radar display suddenly picked up a return less than 10 miles out. This is significant because the long range radar in Anchorage at the time had a range of over a hundred miles. So for something to appear randomly like that was very bizarre. Standard protocol for that happening was to treat it like a potential Soviet ICBM. So they hit the button to scramble the fighters again. While they're waiting for the fighters to get in the air, they were getting more info on the thing and determined its speed to be less than 100 knots and the altitude in the 1,000 foot range. This is normal approach for a small aircraft coming into land. By then, it was less than two miles from the airport, but they couldn't see it. Whatever it was began circling the airport. The fighters had it on their radars, but no visual. Finally, one of the flight leads saw a large blimp-like thing about 400 feet long by maybe 20 wide all black with no lights. They joined up on it and tried to get it on radio, but no dice. Finally, it broke its circular pattern and began ascending at about 2,000 feet per minute until it climbed higher than the fighters could follow and then vanished from radar. The friend said it happened a few times while he was there. It has to make you wonder. Next story. Growing up, my father was a caretaker at a large cemetery in western Kentucky. There was a house on the property that we lived in as part of his salary, and it was nice living on a hundred acres. My childhood was awesome being able to play and roam wherever I wanted to. The cemetery and home only dated back to 1960, so it wasn't very old like some of the other haunted houses that you could think of. I'd forgotten this one story. I was about three or so when it happened, but I do remember bits of things from when I was little but was reminded of it the other day when talking with some co-workers and my dad. But I was taking a bath playing one evening, this was before bed, when I thought I saw my mother walk past the doorway in her nightgown. I called out mom, but she didn't respond. Come to find out, she was outside doing her nightly watering of her plants. Growing up, I was always afraid of the dark. Sleeping with night lights on, my parents always turned the lights on when I went into a room or down the hall. One night, when I was around the same age or a little older, it was just me and my father home. I needed to use the bathroom on the other end of the house in the hallway. I decided I was going to face my fears and not turn on the light. All I remembered was getting halfway down, and suddenly I couldn't move, speak, or anything. Almost like some of these sleep paralysis stories that you hear about, but I was awake. I was finally able to scream out for my dad, and it finally ended. I didn't know what it was, but that freaked me out for several years. Now, we had two living rooms. One was my TV room, and the other my parents, and it had a bathroom in it. One day my mom got out of the shower and saw she saw a little girl in the living room. She searched the house thinking a child visiting the cemetery with their family may have come into the house, but found no one. She told my dad about it, and he laughed it off. One night, a few days later or so, Late in the evening, he was up watching UK basketball. He saw the same little girl walk between him and the TV. 
Needless to say, he went right to bed. He did some investigating in the office and come to find out a birth date on a little girl's monument that had been laid to rest months before was wrong. Once he got it fixed, they never saw her again. Next story. We lived for a while in this horrible old house. It was just awful. Barely habitable. It was a rental house, kind of a slum. It wasn't in an unsafe area, really just an old house that wasn't maintained at all. Anyway, my mother would often get up during the night to check on me. I was about six at the time. Her bedroom was catty corner across the hallway from mine, and when I was in bed I could see across the hallway into her room, and if she was laying in bed I could see about the lower half of her from the waist down to her feet at the end of her bed. One night I was in bed. It was so hot in the house and I couldn't sleep. We had no AC and only fans and open windows to help, which just blew around the hot, humid, stale air. The stench from the nearby paper mill was just awful, too, now that I think of it. The sour, moldy, rotten chicken soup and benzene odor they all gave off. It was stifling. I was lying there. It was late. I couldn't sleep because I was so hot and the air was so stinky. In the darkness of her room across the hall, lit only dimly by the street lights from outside, I saw my mother swing her legs out of bed, stand up, and come across the hall to check on me. But I could see through her. She was wearing a red and white check house dress, or whatever they called it, a lightweight cotton sort of dress that buttoned up the front and had no collar, short sleeves and two big pockets on the front. She wore it to bed regularly. She came into the room and I decided I'd better act like I was sleeping so she wouldn't worry about me because I was still awake. I closed my eyes to bare slits, but I could still see her as she bent over, rested her hand on my chest for a moment, which I felt, then lightly smoothed my hair back and bent to kiss my forehead. She turned around to leave, so I opened my eyes, and yes, I could still see through her. I could see every feature as normal, but she was just sort of transparent. I watched as she went back into her room, but as she entered her room, I could see not only her transparent body, but I could see through her to the bed, and I could clearly see her lower body still laying in the bed. She sat down the edge of the bed, lifted her legs, and then went back into her real legs and body. I wasn't scared. I thought it was a pretty neat trick that mom could do. I don't remember if I ever told her about it at the time, but I did later in life.